My brother, Moses, thank you very much for uh, finding the time and uh, congratulations on your many, many successes and uh, I wish you more, many more. Uh, you have this book, uh, your recent publication, Emir in London. Can you tell me about this book? No, thank you. Uh, um, it, it, it is the question you ask is fitting because uh, there is a phenomenon now in Nigeria that is uh, it's in the popular imagination and it's part of our uh, quotidian conversational lexicon now. It's called Jakba. Jakba simply means the act of leaving one's uh, comfort zone and traveling to other places, far flung places. Mostly, you know, it's, uh, you know, the way it's used nowadays is used as a term that um, explains the phenomenon of migration, Nigerians migrating to Europe and to North America, usually in terms of uh, relocating permanently. And, but, but that phenomenon of Japa also uh, connotes this idea of restlessness and um, the propensity of some of our people to you know, get tired, quote unquote, of Nigeria and to want to try out someplace else or to want to have an adventure uh, in some other parts of the world. And um, so this book goes back in time, goes back in history to look at a particular moment from the 1920s to the 1960s when we have a precedent, if you like, for this Japan phenomenon but uh, in a different way, uh, calibrated differently, but also uh, this type, this migration was temporary. It wasn't a relocation uh, as traditionally understood. This was a set of travel embarked upon by aristocrats and elites from the Northern part of the country. These were emirs and rulers of Islamic uh, states who were embarking on this trip to Britain. Sometimes they took a detour to France Sometimes they took a detour to the U.S., but mostly to Britain. And this story for me is very important because nowadays when we talk about the Jakba phenomenon, we talk about it in terms of people relocating for better economic opportunities, uh, to escape poverty, to escape uh, adverse economic conditions. But these were men, and, and, and they, were, they were mostly men. There were, there were a few women amongst them, but mostly they were men. So these were men of privilege. These were men who had access to the fine things of life. These were men who, you know, even in colonial society, uh, were, were, were favored by the colonial system. Many of them were allies of the British in the colonization process. So these were people who had the means, uh, obviously, to embark on this trip, uh, but they weren't traveling for economic uh, ascendancy, for economic improvements. They were traveling for leisure were traveling for curiosity, they were traveling for adventure. Uh, and these are the things uh, nowadays when we talk about Africans' uh, migration to the West, we don't consider uh, that as a factor. We don't consider those uh, types of uh, variables uh, in our explanatory system in the way that we explain migration. We mostly explain migration now in terms of people just seeking the, the proverbial greener pastures. So I wanted to tell a story that uh, moved in a different trajectory to look at um, a particular moment, a 40, 45 year period in which this group of Africans are very privileged, uh, situated and um, secured for the most part economically, um, traveled uh, to the white man's country, right? For leisure, for adventure. But not only that, they, they came back to tell their stories. And for me, that's the most important part of this um, enterprise, the fact that they felt a need to talk about the white man's country, to talk about what they had seen, what they had done, who they had met with, uh, the things that they, were, they brought back with them, the goods that they bought over there, the things that they consumed. Uh, they, they, they felt a need to come down tonight, to come back to Northern Nigeria and vernacularize all of these sites and commodities and, and, and experiences that they had in Britain, right? They felt a need to convey their impression of Britain in writing uh, in the vernacular, mostly in the vernacular Hausa language, in a Hausa language medium, the newspaper, but also some of them published memoirs, right? 
Uh, they felt a need also, some, some of them felt a need to give public lectures in Hausa and English to, I guess, vicariously uh, bring uh, their audience, you know, their subjects, uh, other Hausa speaking, Northern Nigerians into their travel experience. Uh, and so in, a, in a very self-conscious way uh, and strategically as a way for them to, as they put it in their own memoirs and in their diaries that I use for this research, to give these people a window into life in the metropole, in life in Britain, so that it would, uh, by vicariously participating in this travel, they could have a taste of the metropole and that uh, it could prove transformative to them. They had this um, explicit self-conscious agenda of modernization, of bringing modernity and modernization to this predominantly Islamic part of Nigeria, colonial Nigeria. And they thought that this endeavor of traveling to the West, traveling to Britain, bringing back items, bringing back goods, bringing back experiences, and bringing back technologies and knowledge could help in this task of uh, uh, just uh, uh, you know, uh, building, but also domesticating modernity in this part of Africa. What attracted you to this historical account? And uh, why is this historical account important to you? And why do you think um, is important for historians? And why do you think that account had been neglected? As a historian myself, I was drawn to this story because, you know, Northern Nigeria, traditionally has been understood as um, a place that was conservative culturally, that was um, hostile, or at least not receptive uh, to Western influences, to modernity, a place where you couldn't reconcile the pre-existing traditional Islamic institutions with Western derived ideas and knowledge and, and cultures. So for me, the fact that these um, emirs who were, to be sure, um, traditional rulers, but also Islamic rulers and custodians of uh, centuries old Islamic traditions were so much at ease, you know, in the world of the white man, in the world of the colonizer, as it were, was quite intriguing. And I thought uh, it is a story that, that is important to tell against the background of this media uh, portrayal of Northern Nigeria as a very conservative place that is almost anti-modernist in its orientation. So that, that's one aspect of the story that I thought, you know, as a historian that really drew me in, that I thought uh, needed to be emphasized. You know, this is a story of Africans traveling for leisure, Africans doing what humans do, which is, to look for adventure in places that are not natal to you, uh, in places that are foreign to you, to test yourself, to go someplace where you are no longer in your proverbial comfort zone, uh, to go someplace where the culture is different, to look for adventure in an exotic uh, milieu. Uh, this, is, this is very natural to human, the spirit of adventure. The, the attraction of difference and alterity. This was what, this is the human thing. And for me, it is very important at a time when Africans are being portrayed as people who are desperate to escape their continent for economic reasons, for all kinds of uh, existential reasons, to portray Africans as people who are also, you know, animated by the spirit of adventure, by the natural curiosities that we humans feel towards uh, one another, right? You, 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 you come from a particular place, uh, but you want to transcend that place. You want to, at some point, go over to the other place and find out what makes them tick. What do they do over there? To find out about aspects of their cultures that are, that, are, that are unfamiliar to you. And so in the process, what you are trying to do is to render that exotic place, that place that appears so different, you, are, you want to render it familiar. You want to render it uh, you know, intelligible to yourself, but also to people in your natal community. And I, I wanted to tell a story uh, about these emirs and their travels because I think uh, it's, a, it's a very good um, illustration of the capacity of Africans, you know, to 
so to, to, to go against the grain of this, uh, this, this narrative of Africans only traveling for economic uh, uh, you know, reasons, uh, to show a group of Africans who, bec partly because of their privilege in colonial society, but also partly because of their own um, curiosities, wanted to explore the world of the white man, the world of the colonizer, right? Um, the, the other part of it also, as a historian, uh, is that <clears throat> for very long, we, you know, the terrain of exploration and adventure literature uh, has been ascribed to white European explorers, right? The, you know, um, I don't know about you, but uh, when I was growing up in Nigeria, when, when we would go to school, we were introduced to all the quote and unquote famous explorers, <laughs> European, European explorers who explored the Nigerian areas, the rivers, the fauna, you know, and we were, sometimes we were meant, uh, we were made to read their commentaries, right? We were made to read their narratives. And because of the preponderance and the proliferation of those types of narratives, it is quite common to assume that colonial curiosity went just in one direction, that it was only Europeans who were curious about, you know, the cultures, the flora, the fauna, the geographies and the cultures of Africa, that the curiosity didn't go the other way. And I wanted to show through these um, the aristocratic travels that the curiosity was both ways, that Africans too were just as curious as, uh, as, as white people were uh, about the, the land of the white man, you know, the culture of the white man, the cultures of Britain, the flora, the fauna, what kind of agricultural system do they have over there? What kind of crops do they have? So the basic uh, template, if you pick, if you pick up uh, a typical European travel narrative about any part of Africa, you are likely to get the staples, you know, the, 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 the commentary on the cultures, the language of the people, the food, the flora, the fauna, the rivers, the, all of those things. But Africans also were curious about um, if you went to Britain, what kind of rivers would you see? <laughs> what kind of agriculture uh, would you see? What kind of animals, domestic animals would you see? So Africans were just, uh, you know, driven by those kinds of human instincts and human quest to know the other, right? And I wanted to tell this story as uh, as a way to theorize this uh, mutuality of curio colonial curiosity, uh, curiosity being a two way dynamic, where Africans wanted to know uh, about their colonizers. You know, because part of it was also because the more you knew about your colonizer, about their upbringing, about their socialization process, about their society, uh, the more. You, you, you were equipped, you could be, the better you were equipped to navigate the colonial system. There was a utilitarian uh, quality and purpose to having knowledge about the metropole. And the best way to acquire that knowledge about the metropole was to travel there and observe with your own eyes and with your own senses how the white man lived in his or her society. And then you bring that knowledge back and you put that knowledge to use. Uh, and, 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 and that knowledge helps you to understand why colonial, colonial officials, for instance, were asking you to do certain things, were acting in a certain manner, uh, why some of them were crazy, <laughs> you know, why some of them were acting crazy, why some of them uh, had the habits that they, they had. It helps you to understand the colonizer better and gave you resources that you could use to put yourself in a better situation to cope with the excesses and the violence of colonialism but also to tap into some of the uh, unintended benefits and, and advantages of colonialism, right? So knowledge was something that was utilitarian. And for me, these types of travel that were founded on the principle of leisure and adventure and sightseeing was uh, a, a, a very useful, productive site for acquiring that type of uh, metropolitan knowledge. Uh, finally, one of the things that really drew me into this story that I really wanted to tell this story is that the more I got into it, the more I realized that um, the narratives generated by the travelers, by the emirs and aristocrats, right, published in both English and Hausa and the, the vernacular language, in uh, the dominant vernacular in uh, northern Nigeria, the more I realized that these narratives, these romanized uh, publications uh, in Hausa or English were critical to forging a literary community and a literary culture in Northern Nigeria between the 1920s and the 1960s, right? Uh, the, the, the public sphere, the, the, this, this culture of reading and writing 
that emerged in Northern Nigeria in this period was tied to this appetite uh, for, these, for these types of stories, stories about the metropole, stories that these travelers would write about, you know, what they did. Some of them fantastical, some of them exaggerated, you know, as most stories are, most stories, uh, you know, of travel and of adventure tend to be, you know, but, but, I, but, but the, the, the literary culture that emerged in this period uh, it, through these travel narratives really drew upon pre-existing uh, Hausa folkloric traditions, but also inaugurated and initiated new types of narrative techniques. Uh, some of them derived from the local storytelling, uh, pre-existing pre -existing sto storytelling resources, but some of them quite innovative in the way that they told stories about the metropole. And all of that fed into this emergent literary scene in Northern Nigeria and became, you know, established this uh, newspaper, Gaskia Tafi Kobo, where most of these narratives were, were, were published as an arena of debate and conversation and uh, logic sharing of ideas about colonialism, about Britain, about, you know, uh, colonial relations and so on and so forth. So the, 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 the intellectual community that emerged, the literary community that emerged in this period, I would say had something to do with the emergence of this uh, this this travel endeavor and the narrative that they spawned, that they, that is this endeavor spawned. Yes. Now take me through the whole process of gathering all, all these all this data and trying to make sense of it. I was in an archive. I was in a place called the Arewa House uh, Center for Historical Documentation, which is an archive located in the northern Nigerian city of Kaduna. I was researching something else, actually, something in, in, uh, related to my second book, book project. And I came across this single in this newspaper that I mentioned earlier, Gaskia Tafi Kobo. Uh, it's a house of language newspaper. It was started in 1939. And, and it, members of the emergent Northern Nigerian intelligentsia and the elites uh, who were literate in the Romanized sense of uh, literacy, you know, because there was a already pre-existing Arabic and Ajami literacy, but people who could read in the Roman, uh, and, and many of them were also embedded in various uh, sections of the colonial establishment and the colonial bureaucracy as teachers or clerks and so on, or as in the particular case of the Emirs, as um, allies of the British in colonial administration. They, they read this newspaper uh, religiously. They wrote into this newspaper the participated in the dialogic space that the newspaper uh, provided. They wrote letters to the editors, they published their own stories, they sent in uh, story uh, ideas for stories that they wanted the newspaper editors to publish. So, so my, I was in this archive and I came across this full page narrative with a bold big picture of this emir in his turban and everything. Uh, so so the, the narrative, the text wrapped around this image of the Emir, and it was in Hausa. So I, I started reading it. It's, it's one of those things you do in an archive when you, you are probably tired of looking at the stuff that you went there to, you went there to read and you wanted, uh, you wanted to rest by distracting yourself with something else in the archive that you know maybe was fun to read. And I, I, I started reading it, I just couldn't stop. And I couldn't stop because the narrative just drew me in. So the sheer force of the, 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 the narrative the narrative technique was, um, uh, you know, was just unique. The idioms being employed, the metaphors used in the narrative, uh, harking back to proverbs in the vernacular house of language that I was familiar with, the analogies and the metaphors spoke to me. Uh, and so I started reading and I, and I saw the way that the emir was talking about his travel experience in Britain. He had gone to Britain, he had returned, and this was his travelogue that he was publishing for 10 million Northern Nigerians to read at this time. And, um, and I read it to the end, and I was fascinated. I was blown away by the erudition of the narrative, but also I was blown away by something else. Actually, two things. One, one was that the, the similarity of the techniques used by the emir to the techniques used by you know those same characters the european travel <laughs> traveler 
travelers and explorers, right? If you read some of those narratives. In other words, uh, the, he too, like the European travelers and explorers was using this uh, self-referential technique of looking at Britain, looking at British society through his own society. Uh, all the analogies that he made to metropolitan objects and metropolitan sites and metropolitan technologies were to uh, his own society, to objects and commodities and, and, and technologies in his own society, you're right. It, the, the, the whole narrative was framed in a comparative um, uh, sense. You know, it was, you know, there was a lot of comparison. There was, there was a lot of uh, drawing of parallels. There was a lot of the use of contrast and similitude. This, is, this thing is similar to how we do this, but this is different, this is different. There was a lot of emphasis on difference, this manufacturing of difference, this idea of uh, making the order out to be exotic. So for me, that was fascinating because that is something that we traditionally ascribe to European texts, right? European texts text about Africa, about other colonized spaces. The, the manufacturing of difference is a constant uh, feature. It's a feature of colonial exploratory and travel narratives on Africa, where Africans have to be portrayed in, in very stark terms as different, sometimes irredeemably different, right? Uh, uh, from the European and African ways of life and ways of seeing are also portrayed as you know radically different. And he was using the same technique. Uh, so, so the second thing that I saw that saw there was that there was a self self conscious, in as much as he was doing that, there was also a self conscious deployment of those of those uh, techniques of uh, contrast of, uh, of 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 underlining difference to make a case that Northern Nigerians needed, especially Northern Nigerians who were Muslim and who spoke Hausa, needed to embrace this uh, metropolitan way of life or aspects of it, you know that for them to modernize themselves and to modernize their societies. So for me, these two things uh, just struck me. Uh, the, here was a guy who was trying to make a case for this narrative serving as a blueprint for uh, the spread of modernity, Western uh, and, and modernization in his domain. But here was a guy who also in a way was writing back using the same techniques and the same template and writing back to empire. Uh, and I thought that was quite fascinating because there's no way that he would have read, I don't think he would have, because he didn't read English. And none of these narratives have been published in Hausa. So he couldn't have read Mungu Park or Richard Landa or any of this, uh, explorers who, who published their text before him. Uh, but but I think so, so, so the ethic, what I spoke about earlier was at play for me. I just quickly picked up on it, which is that these two groups of people uh, separated by thousands and thousands of miles and an ocean were essentially driven by the same instincts, you know, the same curiosity, the same thought of how can I find out more? How can I know more about you know, this, this distant place? Uh, that I've become entangled with in colonial terms. How can I acquire knowledge about them? So that was that was for me the beginning of the quest. Once that sparked my interest, uh, it began a ten-year journey for me to find more narratives like that, similar narratives. You know, in personal archives in northern Nigeria, I would visit people and inquire about you know what the 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 the, the, the patriarch uh, the patriarchs of their families these aristocratic families, I would ask them what the patriarchs had left them. Some of them were de uh, dead, what the kind of documents that they left behind. And sometimes I found diaries of their travels to Britain. Sometimes I found handwritten notes of different types, pictures. Uh, and then I went to Britain. I went to the colonial archives in Britain as well. And I saw metropolitan, I got a lot of metropolitan newspaper reports about these travels that this Amy has embarked upon. So apparently, it just opened up a vast world of uh, resources to me, archive, and an entire archive, metropolitan archive to me, of uh, visuals and texts about the travels, the visits of these emirs. Apparently, they attracted quite uh, a lot of attention from the British press, and the British press published a lot of stories and pictures about where they went, what they did, 
and follow them around, sometimes embarrassing them and harassing them. You know, they were basically mobbed by the British press. I liken it to this, uh, I, my, the, the term that I, I came up with for it was a colonial paparazzi. You know, they were subjected to that type of attention. So I started gathering these materials and I went to other archives, uh, institutional archives in Nigeria and found reports about these travels, colonial correspondences and so on and so forth. And then of course I had to supplement that with uh, oral interviews. So I went to some of these palaces where the descendants of these travelers uh, still held, held sway. In, in some parts of, the, of Northern Nigeria, their descendants have become emirs themselves. And they opened up their palaces to me, some of them, and it showed me trophy rooms where the emirs kept souvenirs that they brought from uh, Britain, uh, trophies and medals that they got from the king, because when they would go uh, on these adventures, sometimes, uh, many times they met the king and they shook the hands of the king and the king would give them a medal, which was something that was done frequently at that time, not just for kings visiting from Nigeria, but for kings visiting from other parts of the British, uh, 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 British world in Africa. So that's that's how it began. And then, you know, I began to draft chapters. I think I was in my fifth year into the project when I began to read, because I really wanted to immerse myself in the world, in this uh, people's world and what they, they were thinking. Uh, plus, also, I just enjoyed reading the narratives. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I just enjoy, because the narratives had a literary quality uh, to them, apart from being historical sources for me as a historian. They were just a joy to read about how it was uh, it was very liberating and very edifying to see africans confidently uh and using robust narrative techniques and literary resources to comment on the world of the white man it was a refreshing departure uh for what i was used to as a historian of the colonial period who mostly before that time relied on colonial sources uh, much to my frustration here was a corpus of source, a corpus of sources and documents written by Africans about their impression of the white man, about their impression of the white man's war, about Britain. So I just I just started reading, and uh, I think the arguments and the points and the takeaways began to just occur to me, began to just suggest themselves to me as I began writing. And it, the the writing was uh, the, the the writing part was quite easy to be honest with you. It came very easily to me. Uh, partly because I had spent so much time reflecting on the various aspects and where I wanted certain narratives to be, and we, you know, I could I could visualize the chapters. In fact, uh, before I started writing, because I could say, well, this narrative fits here, this these two narratives fit together, these three narratives, you know, this memoir can fit here, and this. Let me group this uh, this travelogues uh, who, that were published as part of a series in this house of language newspaper. Let me put them in this chapter, uh, and let me, you know, so I could pretty much uh, figure out uh, the, the architecture and the outline of the book. Uh, even, you know, I could do that. And uh, once I did that, the writing came fairly easily and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it because I also, like I said, enjoyed the material that I was working with. What, what surprised you the most from the findings that you encountered? Yes, great question. A um, couple of things. I, I was surprised by the extent the intensity and the tone of the critique that you find in these narratives, critiques of uh, metropolitan society, of British ways of life, of British ways of doing things, ways of seeing. I wasn't expecting that, uh, that level of uh, candor uh, and um, honest commentary on the metropole, in part because, you know, these emirs were wealthy, they were using their resources to fund their travels, right? But they depended on a vast network of colonial logistical resources to embark on these travels, the trains that they took, the ship that they traveled in. Uh, British officials will wait on them, will facilitate their movement through the Sudan and and, and, and Egypt and other parts, Spain. And, you know, so they relied on this quasi diplomatic network facilitated by the British Empire. So, you know, I naturally expected them to be a lot less uh, forthcoming with uh, things that they didn't quite, uh, didn't quite like about the metropole. I wasn't, so I, I was surprised by that, but, you know, they, they were pretty much 
and they were very forthcoming, especially in their memoirs and especially in their vernacular travel narratives and travelogues, right? Uh, they always, uh, you know, some of them were quite, you know, uncomfortably, you know, and, and uh, uh, candid. And on, they, in doing so, they unsettled some of their colonial interlocutors, right? When they would say things like, you know, uh, you know, we, you, you white men are, you know, going to Britain, I, I, I realize that you white men have a lot of uh, faith in your technology, uh, but the, you, you seem to have become a slave to your technology as well. You seem to have been mechanized yourself. You seem to have lost your humanity. Uh, you know, some of them when taken to see, uh, you know, the naval dockyard or some type of military installation would say, well, you know, we can see why, why you are very violent and why you are always fighting wars, why you are always picking fights with people. Because how could you have this uh, kind of weapons and not use them? You wouldn't uh, want to have these weapons. Uh, you know, these this were very sharp, searing critiques of what we, you and I have come to know now as um, this, uh, um, an imperial, war-mongering, military-industrial complex. This was an incipient critique of that. You know, were, this was an articulation of that type of critique. So I didn't see, I didn't see that. I didn't uh, anticipate that. So that, that really surprised me, but in a, a refreshing way that, you know, they were willing to speak those words, even though they were allies of the British, like I said, in colonialism, in colonial rule. And they, you know, they pretty much, their trips to Britain was facilitated by, you know, these colonial resources and technologies, right? The other thing that surprised me was the racism, the rawness of the racism that they encountered uh, at various points and at various sites in Britain. So most of them traveled throughout Britain. They didn't just stay in London. Some of them went to Liverpool, Portsmouth. You know, many of them, they covered quite uh, some real estate. They covered quite some territory while in Britain, Scotland, Ireland. They went everywhere. They encountered a lot of public unvarnished racism. Uh, you know, the colonial reports used all kinds of metaphors to disguise that racism. But if you read the, as I did, if you read the colonial intelligence report, that's when you really you really see the truth of what they, they had to bear, how to how to encounter. Uh, many of them wanted to do things that they couldn't do because people would just stare at them and just uh, exoticize them and orientalize them and, uh, and and ridicule them and shout out questions to them, very embarrassing and condescending questions. Many of them wanted to shop in certain spaces and wanted to do window shopping, wanted to do certain things in public. But the crowds of people would just gather around them and just make them into these exotic uh, human curios and spectacles in ways that made them self-conscious. It was pure unvarnished racism. Uh, in one, on, in one, one incident that I talk about in the book, uh, in Liverpool, no good hotel would actually take them in. None of the, no hotel would take them in because they were blacks and they were dressed in their traditional robes and. I just didn't want anything to uh, want to have anything to do with them, and they had to give them a, a dingy, very dirty hotel that was beneath them. These were aristocrats. These were elites, you know, who were used to luxury, and they had to put them up in some dingy hotel on the outskirts of Liverpool. And of course, they complained daily to their colonial minders and the colonial guys. You know, this is this place is beneath us. It's crawling with cockroaches and insect. We, you know, we can't do anything here. And you know, and you know, the, the, the truth. You, you have to read the colonial intelligence report to find out why that was the case. Because essentially, their guides were lying to them and telling them, "Oh, you know, uh, we had trouble booking other hotels." And, uh, and but but the truth was that you know, uh, it was just racism. No, none of the hotels in the main city would take them in. Uh, so the racism surprised me quite a bit. Uh, the last thing that I would say in terms of surprises is the. The, the, the EMEA's mastery of what I call colonial protocol or colonial hospitality, hospitality, right? They knew what to say, uh, how to say it, who to say it to. They knew how to act in the presence of metropolitan aristocrats, uh, aristocrats metropolitan colonial officials, metropolitan bureaucrats, when they went to the king, when they went to the parliament, when they went to factories, they knew how to conduct themselves. They knew how to be polite. They knew how to be a good guest. Uh, one of the things that they would do, for instance, even as Muslim, Muslim rulers, obviously gambling is forbidden in Islam, but you know they would go to these horse races and dog races and 
other kinds of races, and they would participate in the, 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 the ritual uh, you know, of, of gambling, of just betting a few crowns, just uh, a little change, just to, to be a good guest, right? That's what you do uh, when you are a guest of somebody. Uh, it, they weren't gambling, they weren't gambling for money, so it didn't violate their Islamic devotion, they say. But, you know, you know, in other circumstances, it could have been uncomfortable. But, you know, they were willing to go through with those kinds of... They, they, they knew how to flatter their hosts as well. Uh, not only that, they knew how to use the contrived and improvised, and I would even say pretended hospitality that the metropolitan officials put at their disposal. They knew how to use those that, that, that fake hospitality to their advantage. One of the things that they would do in Britain, for instance, uh, was that they would, um, they had these colonial officials who had served in Northern Nigeria, who volunteered to take them to sea sites, to be their guides to in their sightseeing adventures, or who volunteered to run errands for them. And the emirs and aristocrats took full advantage of that and would send them. This Remember, these were people who in Northern Nigeria they will be answerable to, they will be subordinate to. But in the space of the metropole, the Northern uh, emirs uh, boldly and confidently would send them on errands, go get me this, go get me that, go to Harrods, go to Goldsmith, and go get me this apparel, go get me this. And the colonial officials had to, had to oblige, right? So this inversion, they were able to deftly invert the colonial hierarchy, at least temporarily, for the six weeks that they were there. So that that really was uh, that that inversion, that uh, confident inversion of the colonial hierarchy in those in that moment, uh, in that metropolitan space, was something that really also surprised me uh, in a, in, a, in a refreshingly pleasant way, I must say. Yes, Moses, what would you hope that readers of your book are going to take from it? I guess the first thing would be that. Um, I, I think I'm a historian, first and foremost, but uh, in, terms, in terms of African intellectual debates, uh, in, and also in just in terms of African studies in general, I want this book to spark a debate that reorient, reorients us and our perspectives uh, from this tendency to devalue and to dismiss elite perspectives um, and the perspectives of aristocrats because the our, our our i think our natural instincts as scholars of africa given the violence of colonialism is to dismiss the voices and the texts and the experiences of aristocrats and elites under colonialism as the texts and the voices and the perspectives of people who were compromised by their entanglement and their involvement, and even their, uh, their, 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 their benefits from the colonial system. And I think that, 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 that sometimes is misleading and that can deprive us of some of the very salient uh, insights or from that we can derive from this the perspective of these elite aristocratic travelers. I think because they were insiders in some sense in the colonial enterprise, they come to us with deep knowledge, with an intimate knowledge of the colonial system that we would not get from the perspectives of regular Africans, right? There is a tendency in the literature to privilege the perspectives of regular people who were, were victims of colonialism who had, quote and unquote, an authentic colonial experience, right? So we tend to place their perspectives above the perspectives of elites who were privileged, who were favored in the colonial system, who in some ways we, we like to call them collaborators, right? I mean, you know, in some senses they collaborated. There's no question about that. But I think uh, in terms of, you know, our attempt to understand colonialism and the colonial African colonial experience, I think focusing exclusively on the perspectives of regular, non-aristocratic, non-elite Africans, doesn't get us the full picture. I think so a, a story like this, a book like this, I hope will uh, reorient us to more, to take more seriously um, the perspectives of Africans who uh, for all kinds of reasons may have, you know, immersed themselves in the cultures 
uh, and in the ideas and in the technologies and in the commodities of the white man who may have traveled to the world of the white man and uh, enjoy themselves there and for leisure and for sightseeing. Uh, but I don't think that um, renders their archives and their texts and their memoirs and their recollections any less valuable than the recollections and the experiences and the perspectives of Africans who probably had a, a rougher time with colonialism, who were victimized in very brutal, uh, you know, raw uh, manner, who probably were traumatized by colonialism. Uh, but, I, you know, I think the perspective of elites should matter. The other thing for me is that uh, I, I hope this book historicizes something about Northern Nigeria, which is that there was a time between the 1920s and the 1960s when Northern Nigerian elites and Islamic rulers and aristocrats were quite receptive, you know, strategically receptive, I should say, to Western ideas and Western influences. Uh, and, and that needs to be juxtaposed against what the portrayals of Northern Nigeria today as a place that is racked by Islamic fundamentalism, as a place that this, this, this sensationalized portrayal of Northern Nigeria as a place that is so conservative and so anti-modernist, uh, so anti-Western and is riddled with an anti-Western uh, uh, sentiment. Uh, I, think, I think we need to take a step back in history and look at the time when the rulers, the custodians of the Islamic traditions of Northern Nigeria were very much at home with colonial ideas. They knew how to navigate colonial ideas and colonial goods and colonial influences without violating the prescriptions and the prohibitions of their faith of Islam. They, they, they found a way to reconcile the two aspects of their experiences and their influences, right? The, their rootedness in the, in the Islamic tradition and the colonial influences that came with the British. They knew somehow, they, 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 they were very good. Um, they, they did a very good job of maneuvering through that complex terrain of uh, co different cultures and different influences. And in so doing, they even served as a role model. You know, they modeled a, a technique for engaging with colonial goods and colonial ideas and colonial influences and institutions without losing your Islamic devotion. There were models of that. And I think that holds a lesson, I would say, for Northern Nigeria today. Uh, we, we, we can look back in this, in this story, this history that I tell in this book and say, maybe it is possible. Maybe this, uh, the, 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 the bleak portrayal of Northern Nigeria as irredeemably, irredeemably lost to fund, uh, fundamentalism, extremism, uh, is is exaggerate. I mean, I think it's exaggerated and misplaced, because the same uh, rulers, the same uh, Islamic uh, rulers and aristocrats, uh, are still there today. Um, some of them, you know, uh, their offsprings are still occupying the same positions, and so it just gives us a sense of perspective that, you know, maybe those who say, well, Northern Nigeria is lost, is lost, uh, you know, it's. Uh, maybe that's uh, it's a premature when you read a story like this, you think, okay, where well, there's a possibility that there will be there could be a resurgence of these types of pragmatic engagement with the world, right? With the world outside of Nigeria, with the world outside of northern Nigeria. This pragmatic strategic engagement with the outside world, with Judeo-Christian influences, right, with uh, uh, metropolitan institutions, this EMEA has found a way even to um, instrumentalize a lot of things that they learned from Britain. Many of them came back to their Emirates and built schools and introduced certain elements. They modernized, they used resources and knowledge acquired in Britain while they were there to modernize their agricultural systems. Some of them, like the Emir, one of the Emirs that I discussed in the book, Muhammad Udikko, he introduced, he modernized uh, his police force, the police force of the Emirates, using ideas gathered from Britain. He, and he attracted a lot of colonial patronage. He introduced the game of polo. He introduced other kinds of European modernist institutions in his domain. Uh, and today he is remembered as uh, one of the great modernizers, uh, quote unquote, uh, in Northern Nigeria. And his people in Katsina 
you know, have very fond memories of how he was able to deftly maneuver in the colonial space, in the interstices, to the extent possible, because there was there were all these colonial structures, but he found ways to maneuver into setting, uh, into accessing certain resources that he used uh, to modernize, as it were, or to, you know, bring certain uh, uh, infrastructures to his domain. And that didn't take away, that didn't take away from his Islamic devotion, from his authenticity, from his legitimacy as an Islamic ruler. Uh, finally, uh, I think, in a, on a, relatedly, I think uh, it just a story like this just uh, helps us to humanize, to better humanize Africans, right? To, you know, tone down our tendency to excessively exoticize Africans as uh, a group of people who are animated and motivated and by impulses that are different from those that motivate and uh, uh, activate other, other humans, uh, especially Europeans. We are just as human as other people. We act, we, you know, we want to find out what uh, lies on the other side of the ocean. We want to travel, for adventure, to find out, to acquire knowledge. We want to bring back that knowledge to use in an instrumental way to improve ourselves and to improve our society. We want to contrast our conditions with the conditions of other people. We examine other societies from the perspectives of ourselves. In other words, we construct self-referential narratives about other societies. We use the lens of our upbringing, of our you know, prejudices, if you like, of our socialization to evaluate and to judge other societies. These are all generic human qualities that Africans possess. And so hopefully you read a story like this and you, you, you stop and think, well, you know, uh, you see all these images of Africans trying to cross the Mediterranean and trying to you know, go to Europe to, for a better life. And it, you, you realize that's not the whole story. You realize Africans are also very adventurous. They are driven by the spirit of uh, exploration, of inquiry, of uh, curiosity. And you know, in the very early period of um, the 20th century, from the 20s, Africans were doing that, were crisscrossing the world of their own volition. This was not part of some forced diasporization, right? We often understand Africa's migration from mostly the perspective of forced migration, the slave trades and Africans and being forced out of the continent by harsh conditions and war and famine and disease. And But this is a, a totally different story. Uh, maybe it's not the dominant story, but it's actually when you write this story into this pre-existing intellectual space that portrays Africa, as a desperate uh, place that uh, basically offloads its uh, humanity to other parts of the world. Maybe it, it causes you to realize that, uh, uh, you know, Africans are, are polyvalent uh, and have, uh, you know, Africans are just not a single monolithic entity defined by one single explanation or one story, that African adventures and migrations take many forms, you know. So that's what I'm hoping that people will take away from this. Uh, these are the things that I want them to take away from this book, ultimately. Edward Dan Moses. Very well done. Very well done.